Thank you for listening to The Rest is History. For bonus episodes, early access, ad-free listening, and access to our chat community, sign up at restishistorypod.com. That's restishistorypod.com. Old Silicon Valley really was the Wild West. Valleyites stole one another's product designs, one another's wives, and one another's employees. They fought to the death all day and went out drinking together at night. And deals that would one day be worth billions were often made with a handshake. That was Michael S. Malone in The Big Score, the billion dollar story of Silicon Valley, which he wrote in 1985. And Dominic, um, since 1985, Silicon Valley has gone from strength to strength. And in fact, you could almost say that it's probably um, in terms of today's economy, culture, civilization, probably the single most important place on the face of the planet. Yeah, I think you can you can you can say it's probably the most important place in our lifetimes. So 1985 was the year that uh, Max Sorin, uh, the villain in A View to a Kill, tried to destroy Silicon Valley <laughs> to give himself control over the world's silicon chip sort of industry. And that was the first time I was ever going to the Bond film was was ever aware of Silicon Valley. And obviously, since then, you know, in our working lives, the way we interact with, I mean, the fact that we're Tom, we're doing this, you know, we do all our podcasts. Yes, you know, on Zoom. Listeners um, may imagine that we're meeting up and doing this in a studio. We're not. Yeah, I've never, I've never seen Tom Holland in the flesh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no. So, so this is a massive world historical phenomenon, isn't it? And, and absolutely worth discussing in a history podcast. I think. Um, I, I, yes, yeah. complete. Well, so we did an episode on California, and we kind of touched on on the development of Silicon Valley there. But I think this is a subject that needs a much, much closer focus. So in today's episode, we want to look at the history of Silicon Valley. Why did it, how did it begin? Why there? You know, where's it going? And we are hugely privileged to have had talking about this, one of the most influential figures in the development of the internet. So basically yeah. it's, it's like talking to Isambard Kingdom Brunel about the industrial revolution. And our guest was Mark Andreessen. We talked to him um, a couple of uh, weeks ago. Do you want to big him up? I mean, Mark is a, a Mark was a. Uh, it was bizarre that we even got him to come on the podcast because um, he's far more too important to waste his time talking to people like us. But, but clearly not. Um, so Mark's Andreessen's most is best known because he basically is one of the founding fathers of the very first internet browser. So that was something called Mosaic, which became Netscape. Um, lots of old listeners will remember having used it, but also he's then dabbled in almost every single aspect of, I mean, dabbled is the wrong word, been involved with almost every single aspect of, of the internet. And, and, you know, Facebook is on the board of Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Skype, Airbnb. Uh, I think he was on the board of eBay. I uh, was involved with PayPal. So in other words, basically everything you use on a daily basis has Mark Anderson's um, fingerprints all over it. But also, also a great, I mean, a great thinker. So not just an investor in the internet, everything, but, but thinking about where it's going. I mean, I guess you have to be, you're not going to make money unless you're thinking about it. But I mean, he's kind of really interested in placing it in the, the, the broadest his, yeah. historical context. So it was, it was slightly nerve wracking, wasn't it? To meet, yeah. to meet this titan of the internet via, via Zoom. <laughs> Yeah, yeah well, basically our, our internet skills had to be on tip top form. <laughs> absolutely. Um, <laughs> absolutely. But um, bless him. He he yeah. came on and was, um, well, I think, I mean, listen, listen to first, this episode. He was our first billionaire guest, I think. I don't think I don't think Jonathan <laughs> Wilson's a billionaire. I don't think Ted Valance is a billionaire. But Mark <laughs> no. Andreessen definitely was. <laughs> definitely. Um, and so uh, we kicked things off by asking him the very obvious question, would he agree with us that um, the development of the internet is uh something of world historical significance yeah well for, first of all thank, thanks for having me um long time listener uh, first time caller um so uh as you read the quote from my, my friend michael malone um who i've, I've been i've known, known for a long time and i'm just a huge fan of and i really recommend his his book uh, the big score was just reissued by stripe press and i really recommend everybody read it but um as you read the quote i actually remember he probably talks in the book um, the bar that uh, all the chip guys that he talks about uh, in the 60s and 70s would go to every night was called the wagon wheel. 
which was an old Western bar uh, in Mountain View. Um, and um, when we opened up shop for our company Netscape in 1994 in Mountain View, um, guess what bar we would go to uh, at the end of every night? Um, the Wagon Wheel. Wagon Wheel. <laughs> so, so, so sitting in this sort of increasingly, you know, kind of run down, you know, li- you know, quite literally like Old West themed bar. Um, and so the, uh, you know, the, the, the symbolism, uh, symbolism uh, runs deep for sure. Well, well the, the fact it's the Wagon Wheel, and yeah. that in a way, California is the kind of the end of the journey, isn't it? Uh, yeah. I mean, do you think is is Silicon Valley a kind of a, a continuation of the American frontier? The idea that you have to go forwards all the time. Yeah. So I was born and I was I was I grew up in you know the rural Midwest, you know, northern Wisconsin, and, and it was always this, you know. There was, you know, just as, you know, I didn't have any real sense of the sort of like deep history, but like, you know, even as a kid, it's like there's this like, you know, sort of romance, uh, you know, to California. And, you know, I think there has been in, in, you know, in America for like 150 years. And um, and so, you know, upon graduating, you know, college, I, I you know, I headed west <laughs> right? following the the sort of, uh, you know, the, the, the original trail. And of course, you know, what happens if you head west in the U.S. is, you know, you, you head west until you hit the ocean and then you stop. Um, yeah, you know, since we, we actually did uh, build up, build out the territories, uh, you know, earlier on. And so, um, if you go as far as you can to the West and then stop, you end up in, you know, on the coast of California and you, you basically end up either in, you know, the dream factories of Los Angeles or you end up in the dream factories of the San Francisco Bay area. Um, and, um, and yeah, and, and you know, it's, it's sort of, as I've, as I've started to appreciate the history ever since, including that I'm just the latest in the long line of people who have made this trek, um, you know, yeah, there is a, you know, there is a, you know, the, the, the frontier, the frontier spirit, I think you'd have to say like last and longest in California, you know, the, the, um, the, the two histories that fascinate me. So, you know, one is the Northern California of the California gold rush. Um, yeah. And so you, you literally have the land where, you know, the streets are, you know, the streets are in theory paved with gold. It's a little bit harder to dig, <laughs> dig the gold out, but it's there. Um, and then, you know, in Southern California, you have this whole other thing, which I'm also fascinated by, which is sort of the, the uh, you know, they literally like dream the city into existence right out of, out of the desert. And that, you know, that's a whole, that's a whole saga of its own. Um, but then, you know, the problem with California, you know, the problem with the American frontier is like it, it, it did stop. You hit the edge of the coast, the physical frontier did stop and you couldn't go any further. Um, and so, you know, my, my, my sense is, yeah, what, what's basically been happening since, since that, you know, since the literal development of the physical frontier um, is that we have been busily, uh, you know, building uh, basically new virtual frontiers. And, you know, of course, right. Of course, you know, the internet is a, is, is the new virtual frontier. Of course, you know, the center of the development of the internet turned out to be, um, you know, California. And if you were sort of dating this, revolution if if we were if we want to place it in time as well as in place when do you think it it really started so the uh, world war Two or before that or in the 70s when when should we when should we start our story yeah, so there's another friend of mine actually uh steve, his name is steve blank um and he's a longtime valley entrepreneur himself and actually has become quite a quite a historian um in his in his um in his in more recent years and um he has this this talk you can find on YouTube, and I think it's called the, the Deep History of Silicon Valley. And he's he's sort of reconstructed, you know, kind of it as far back as you can go. So the the typical way the story is told is that it starts basically with Hewlett Packard. Um, so it starts with uh, an engineering dean at Stanford named Fred Turman, who who basically encouraged his you know young young students Bill and Dave, right, um, Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard to start Hewlett Packard. Um, you know, they, they actually start Hewlett Packard in the late 1930s. Um, they then actually put the company on ice for seven years because they go off to fight World War II. Um, and so they put it in suspended animation, go fight the war. They come back, they sort of, you know, <laughs> de you know, in 1945 and it, it becomes kind of the iconic Silicon Valley company. So, so that's the typical history there. Steve argues there's actually a prehistory to it. Um, and the prehistory actually is the development of, of military technology, um, mm. uh, for, uh, between World War One and World War Two. And so there were a series of basically advanced R and D labs, um, in Northern California in the 1920s and 1930s that developed a lot of the key technologies around radar and around, uh, you know, guidance systems and around air, you know, air, you know, modern aircraft control systems for aircraft. Um, and in fact, there's still, you know, a significant engineering presence out here for Lockheed Martin and other defense contractors, you know, this kind of buried uh, amidst the tech companies. Um, and so he, he actually argues that actually predates that, that actually the, the actual engineering culture actually started with development of post-World War One. You know, his, you know, his, his argument basically is like World War One was like the first war where, you know, basically, at least in America, people were like, you know, OK, you know, <laughs> technology is really going to matter. Like, you know, it, it's not, you know, it's going to be, you know, aircraft are going to in a particular play a huge role. Um, and so they, they recruited the best and brightest and put them to work out here. So that, that's the ultimate theory. So you've got the, you've got the military and I suppose also you've got Hollywood to the south. So you've got the idea of of. of- creating dreams um stanford also is quite important isn't it you've got this incredible <laughs> university at palo alto um 
and you need the, the brightest and the best to fuel this revolution, right? Yeah, and there's a few really interesting things about Stanford. So, you know, Stanford, I think generally, I think it's, it was, first of all, Stanford absolutely plays a central role. It's 100% correct. And we could, we could talk a length about that. I think there's a few interesting things about Stanford historically. You know, so one is, I think, you know, it's fair to say that it's a university on par with, you know, the Ivy League, um, but it's technically not part of the Ivy League. Um, and it was started much later uh, than the universities in the Ivy League. It's a product of the 1880s, 1890s. Right. So it's a product of the railroad boom uh, and the, you know, the sort of, quote unquote, robber barons of that era. Um, and you, you, you may know that the university itself is named Stanford because it's named after uh, Leland Stanford, Jr., uh, who was the son of Leland Stanford, who was one of the main you know, uh, people who built out railroads in the U.S. Uh, his son tragically died at the age of 16. And so he and his wife, um, you know, started the university to basically, uh, you know, basically carry on his, his, his son's legacy, their son's legacy. And so. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a sort of a, the university is a product of kind of the second industrial revolution. Um, you know, it, it also was, of course, geographically isolated, right? It wasn't on the East Coast with the rest of the Ivy League. Um, and then the combination of, I think, being started later and not being on the East Coast meant both that it was <laughs> more insecure, um, but also more open minded. Um, and, and then, you know, you, you go forward not that far, right? Between whatever, let's say it was founded in its modern form around 1890, you know, it was only about, you know, 40 years. Um, until this this guy I mentioned, Fred Terman, had Bill and Dave, um, uh, you know, in 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 his class there, and encouraged them to start their first company. So you know, sort of you know, very quickly developed into what it is today. Um, the most remarkable thing about Stanford, both then and now, compared to many other research universities, is Stanford is very um, laissez-faire um, on allowing its both students and faculty to start companies um, based on the research work that they do when they're on campus. Um, most universities, including the one I went to, University of Illinois, are, you know, sort of intrinsically hostile uh, to the idea that students or faculty would sort of, quote unquote, take research off campus and turn it into a business <laughs> for, for a variety of reasons. Um, and Stanford has always been openly encouraging of that. And, and, and it's, you know, it, it's a model that's worked, you know, obviously just incredibly well. Um, and so it's, you know, you, you have to get Stanford credit, not just for the intellectual property of the Valley, but also sort of creating this ethos that, you know, knowledge exists to be able to use to build products and build businesses, which is, which is not normal. And Mark, um, stereotypically, the kind of people who came to California in the kind of gold rush and then, you know, in later kind of migrations, they came from the Midwest. They were kind of, you know, white Protestants from rural backgrounds seeking a new life. Is that true? Do you think of the of the people who come west to, to sort of kickstart the the computer revolution as well? You know, so it was true in the like 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, and you know, another historical figure that you know sort of matches the template, by the way, that you could you could trace is uh, Philo Farnsworth, um, who was the uh, you know sort of the credited as sort of the inventor of color television. Um, and, um, he, um, you know, he, he was this, he was another classic example of like basically the Midwest farm, farm boy who came to San Francisco and, you know, created, created technology. Um, you know, Bob Noyce, um, is sort of in, in many ways, you know, sort of the godfather of Silicon Valley along with, you know, Hewlett and Packard. Um, Bob Noyce was the co-founder and CEO of Intel. Um, and, um, you know, was kind of the father figure kind of through the fifties and sixties. Um, you know, he also, he was an Iowa farm boy, <laughs> right, you know, right along the lines of, of, of what you described. Um, and so, that, you know, that, that for sure is an archetype. And obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm another one of those. Not, not to compare myself to these guys, but I'm, I'm you know, I, I, I fit that archetype perfectly. I, I discovered to my enormous shock later, later on. Um, um, but, you know, really then what happened was starting in the 1960s and 1970s, the phenomenon basically just like radically expanded. Um, and in particular, in terms of uh, global uh, imports of talent. Um, and so, you know, you know, and, and in particular, like, I, I think the first really big breakthrough there was what became known later on as the Hungarian Mafia, um, which is you had these just you had this cluster of these just super geniuses um, from Hungary um, who uh, escaped communism um, in some cases, by the way, on foot, um, uh, you know, in the 1950s and 1960s. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, univer you know <laughs> kind of uniformly had, you know, advanced engineering PhDs. Um, you know, incredibly brilliant uh, people. Um, and, you know, they, they were the other sort of, um, you know, it was sort of the wasps plus the Hungarians that basically created Intel and created the modern chip industry. And, and Andy Grove, um, you know, Andy Grove is sort of, the, you know, one of the legends of, of American technology. His, you know, his, his given name was uh, Andras Grove. He was himself from Hungary. He, he famously like walked out of Hungary on foot, you know, dodging tanks. And I think what was it like 1956? 
Um, and so, um, you know, that that was a that was a dramatic turn. And then, of course, you know, in the, in the decades since, you know, once immigration really, you know, kind of opened up in the, I guess, the 1960s, um, you know, that, now it's just like a, it's, a, it's an it's an amazing kaleidoscope. Like it's like the United Nations, right? You go you go to the cafeteria of any of these big companies, you know, today or you go to any venture capital firm and watch the entrepreneurs going through. And it's just like it's just this amazing, you know, constellation of talent, um, you know enormous um you know kind of you know kind of clusters from uh you know india and, and china in particular but um you know tons of russians tons of eastern europeans you know uh tons increasingly of uh, south americans um uh central americans tons of um yeah, well um you know um the brits um you know i was about to say he's not mentioning brits Tom. this is very uh <laughs> very worrying yeah we need to stick well, up for me. charles babbage and ada <laughs> lovelace and uh Cause, well, cause... Give you, so here's so here's here's one amazing thing. Um, the French uh, the, the French represent themselves very well, um, and so uh, one one of our rules of thumb in the valley uh, uh, out here in our in our rich capital business is every French entrepreneur is fantastic. Um, they are just uniformly fantastic, and I think part of it is you know they're a product of the French educational system and and so forth, and then part of it is of course they made the decision to leave France. Um, right. And this is terrible right. news though. Yeah, this runs completely counter to the ethos of this podcast. <laughs> the, Brits, the Brits are doing quite well uh, also. So, well, I'm relieved, uh, relieved yeah, to hear. We, 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 we would encourage more. Yeah, feel free to send more, more of your best and brightest. So, so Mark, by, by the 70s, uh, you've, so this valley, it's originally Santa Clara Valley, right? And covered in orange groves and orchards and things. Uh, by the 70s, yep. they've all gone. It, it's this massive hub of industry. And I'm guessing that for Silicon Valley to become the Silicon Valley we have now, you need to develop hardware and software. And Silicon Valley does both. And the, the hardware, the key hardware is the development of the personal computer. Am I right about that? Well, so we would argue that the key hardware was the chip. Um, right. So, yeah. um, so know, hence the Silicon. Made, made, yeah, hence the Silicon. And this is why, you know, this is why it's still called like, like you know, there are still chip companies in the valley, you know, Intel's still here, of course. NVIDIA, you know, is probably the most innovative chip company in the world right now. And they're, you know, they're here, um, you know, they do all the graphics chips. Um, so, um, you know, there's still a chip component. Of course, the chips aren't manufactured here. They used to be actually manufactured here. They really aren't manufactured here anymore. You know, the fabs now exist, you know, in other places. Uh, it's too expensive to, to, to run them here. But, um, you know, that, that, that's still here. But it's not the central industry anymore, uh, as you point out, like so software and, and Internet broadly, you know, are, are kind of the central industry now. But you know, the, the, you know, Silicon Valley has, of course, the sort of iconic ring to it. But I think also I think that name will stick for a long time precisely because of the central importance of the hardware um, and, and, and the central importance of the chip. Um, you know, and then I would also just, you know, connect your your, your, your thing on the PC. Like I, you're, you're, you're right about the PC. You're right about the PC as follows, I think, which is, um, you know, the PC was the big breakthrough that sort of took computing to the masses. Right. Because, you know, computers existed for you know 40 years in kind of modern form before the PC hit. Um, and, and so that, that was the big breakthrough. Um, the PC was directly enabled by the chip. And when I say the chip, I actually mean something very specific. I mean, um, what's, what's called the integrated circuit, um, or the microprocessor. Um, and so the big breakthrough that Intel had that made Silicon Valley possible, um, was basically taking, um, a lot of different, uh, kinds of, um, uh, components. Um, that would have made up a computer in like 1960, um, you know, many, many different, many, literally many different individual components, and then literally putting them all together on a single piece of silicon. Um, right. And, and then sort of the minute that happened, then all of a sudden the cost, um, you know, dropped lit dramatically to build a computer. Um, and then all of a sudden the PC became possible. Uh, the, you know, the, the PC itself, the, you know, the IBM PC was, was, uh, it was, uh, you know, kind of assembled in, uh, I think in Florida by IBM, uh, at one of their labs, but, you know, it was basically an assembly of, Technologies basically clustered around the chip, and then other technologies that were developed mostly in Silicon Valley. You know, my, 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 you know, Microsoft is, you know, Microsoft then obviously provided the operating system for the PC. Microsoft was a company based in Seattle, of course. We, we in Northern yeah. California consider Seattle to be a colony, a suburb <laughs> um, of, uh, of of the Valley. I think the people in Seattle disagree, but um, yeah, but, it was really that that chip that was the breakthrough. I say, but what what is the significance of of Apple and mm -hmm. Steve Wozniak? Um, and Steve Jobs coming together and founding Apple, putting out first the Apple One and then the Apple Two. Is, is is that a key moment in the history of Silicon Valley? I mean, that's how I, I think of it. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. So, so there were, and in fact, to complete the history, you know, there were personal computers before the PC, right? So when we say PC, usually we now mean IBM PC or IBM compatible PC. You know, might we not you now consider like a Microsoft Intel. Uh, PC. Like the, the reason Microsoft and Intel are, you know, became the companies they did is because IBM selected them for the IBM PC and then everybody else cloned the IBM PC architecture and created, the, you know, what were called at the time PC clones. And that led to the, 
you know, and, and there are four companies today like Dell, you know, and so forth that build PCs. Um, but before the IBM PC in 1982, um, and even before Microsoft and Intel got established to the, to, to the roles that they then played in the industry, uh, you know, the dominant roles they played, um, uh, there were there were personal computers before the PC, and, and you know, one and there were, by the way, there were many different kinds of personal computers before the PC, right? There were you know dozens, if not hundreds, um, of different basically consumer uh, computers that you could buy in the late '70s, early '80s. Um, you know, Radio Shack famously had a line. Um, you know, that Atari, the video game company, had a line. Texas Instruments, the kind of legendary Texas tech company, had a line of PCs. Um, and then, and then, yeah, Apple was you know was was, was iconic in that era. Um, you know, Apple. Well, there's you know there's a rabbit hole we could go down, which is the the valley sort of a hybrid of like a '50s. I don't know, like uh, car culture, um, you know, conservative uh, sort of cultural thread that like Bob Boyce came out of. And then there's like a 1960s hippie counterculture thread that Steve Jobs came out of. And Apple kind of combined those two threads. And then Steve Wozniak was kind of, you know, the engineer that pulled it together. And so, and, and then those guys in the 1970s, there was this phenomenon. There was this thing in the 1970s famously called the Homebrew, called the Homebrew Computer Club, the HCC. And Homebrew Computer Club, literally, you know, quite literally meant people who were building their computers at home. Which was this weird fringe hobby thing in the nineteen seventies yeah. in the valley, and that's what and Wozniak these... is doing. I mean, he's, yeah, exactly. He's so the there, best. There was this, exactly, there was this crowd uh, of uh, basically nerds. Um, uh, you know, they'd have day jobs at you know HP or whatever. Yeah, he, the, the brilliant description from Michael Malone uh, of, of of Woz was the kid in high school. No one knew the muscleless lump with glasses. Everyone thought was weird, but who could build <laughs> damn near anything electronic. Whereas Steve Jobs was the kind of He's the sales guy. He's the he's a brilliant salesman, isn't he? Steve Jobs selling yeah. himself, his brand, his company, and and a kind of the sense of Apple as a is that right there at the beginning with Apple? Um, is that sense of Apple as a as a as a lifestyle, as a kind of dream of? I mean, that sort of sense of the frontier is very much part of Apple, isn't it? You know, made in California by Apple. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That, that, that's right. And then, and then, you know, he also did, you know, kind of the same thing that kind of David Geff did in music, right, at the sort of in the 60s and 70s also, which is he also, he kind of, it, it was that, and then he also kind of packaged up the California ethos and to, to some extent, the hippie ethos, um, and sort of imbued the technology with that ethos. Right. Um, and so you, you kind of, you kind of got by buying an Apple computer, you kind of got to participate in the technological future, but also the cultural future. Yeah. Um, and mm-hmm. he put a much more consciously cultural and countercultural, uh, kind of element on the whole thing. Like, you know, in, <laughs> Intel, Intel was not countercultural, right? right? Like yeah. th- those guys were like, it was like, you know, white, you know, white shirts, you know, white short sleeve, dress shirts, black ties, you know, buzz cuts, um, you know, and then Apple was like hippie central. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, as part of the kind of the great <laughs> part of the great packaging, you know, part of the, one of the great accomplishments of American industry in the 1960s, 1970s yeah. was to pack package up the hippie counterculture movement and sell it to you. Yeah. I mean, I think the story of Apple would be a fantastic podcast in itself, isn't it? Because it has so many kind of associations. I think back to that California podcast we did, Tom, um, all about the sort of the California dream and stuff. And Apple absolutely incarnates that, doesn't it? But at the same time, there's a kind of nightmarish. So do you remember that? I mean, it's, nightmarish is a weird word, but do you remember that advert? I think it was 1984 during the Super Bowl, um, and it was this sort of Orwellian. So someone smash a screen or something, and it's the future is going to belong to the Apple Mac. And it wasn't wrong, was it? It wasn't yeah. wrong. But I think talking of commercial breaks, yeah, the perfect <laughs> opportunity to uh, to go to a commercial break ourselves. Uh, the Super Bowl had Apple. Let's see what we've got. I think we've got much better ads than Apple's had. Let's find out. 
Welcome back to The Rest is History. I'm sure you'll agree that our adverts are much better than Apple's Super Bowl advert from 1984. Um, we're here with Mark Andreessen, who's basically talking us through the history of Silicon Valley and the internet. Mark, here's something that occurs to me. Almost everybody that we've talked about, I think almost exclusively so far, um, has been a man. And there's always been this sort of, um, not controversy, but there's always been this debate about how much the internet and Silicon Valley are based on a, on a specifically masculine culture is that right do you think that's fair yeah so i was, was gonna say yeah there's you know this gets to be a very complex topic uh, of course very, very controversial and, and also let me say like there were very significant women along the way um you know some of which i've actually have, you know, gotten over the years who you know played really fundamental roles uh so there's a woman named sandy kurtzig who was one of the creators of the software industry there was uh, judy estrin another friend of mine was one of the creators of the networking industry um you know the networking computers together so so you know for sure they existed but yeah for sure the the majority you know the ma majority were men um, right. Yeah, look, there, you know, there's a component to it that's basically, you know, the, probably the exact same gender conversation you'd have in kind of any, you know, kind of any of these new fields over time. Um, um, you know, but yeah, the other part is the, you, 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 you mentioned this, the, the, nerd, the nerd culture aspect to it, um, which is, you know, we, <laughs> we live, well, this is one of the things that's happened, right? We, we live in a world today where, you know, I don't know if nerds are cool, but like plenty of people have packaged up nerd energy and figured out how to sell it. Um, and then nerds have figured out how to start companies and build products and, you know, uh, from time to time, get rich on this stuff. Um, and so, you know, there's a, you know, there's a status hierarchy and a, and a sort of a success in life that, that sort of nerds have, have sort of developed over the last 30 or 40 years that probably didn't exist before that. Um, and so, yeah, there was, there was definitely a component to that. Um, I, I think, I think, mo you know, I think the homebrew computer club would have been thrilled. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and more women show, show, showed up to one of the meetings yeah but well, they maybe not known what to say <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, so 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 we, we have um we've got the pc we've got this kind of incredible concentration of of first american and then global talent concentrated um south of the south of san francisco um and then you've got the internet so what is this what's the significance of the internet how does the internet take off and kind That's of a big question, Tom. That is i know a but but question. but i know you are the one man i can ask this question to and know that you won't be bullshitting when you answer well so the internet you know so like like a lot of the tech industry so the internet starts with a, a story of basically military research right so the internet starts with a, a generation of research starting in the 1950s and the, the literal origins right of it were uh, nuclear command and control networks right which is you know, so you're the United States in 1950s. You're 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 you know you're embarking on, on the Cold War. Um, you've got these nuclear missiles and silos all over the country, um, you know, and on submarines and on aircraft and so forth. And you have to have a control system. Um, but of course, the problem with nuclear command and control is what happens if there's a nuclear war and your command and control system gets knocked out, um, right? Um, and so then you can never, you know, your 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 counter strike ability is lost. And, and then you know the game theory says, you know, the minute that happens, the other the minute the other side knows they can take out your command and control system, then the game theory of nuclear war says they have to launch the first strike immediately because that's the chance. So this is like, you know, this is one of the biggest kind of highest tension issues in the military technology space. Um, then, so it's basically, how do you build a network? How do you build a computer network that can withstand a nuclear war? Well, and so the, the key principle became, how do you route around damage, right? And so if one node of the network is taken out, um, you know, how can you still get a message from point A to point B? And that led to this idea of packet switching, um, which is the basis of kind of, mod of, of the modern internet. Um, um, that then gets commercialized, uh, starting in the 1960s by a whole series of companies, um, including my, my, my friend Judy. Um, and then, um, you know, subsequently the, the federal government funds this project in the 1980s called, uh, the NSF net, uh, National Science Foundation. And they, they basically, um, uh, pay for the first kind of high speed broadband internet in the way that we don't understand it that links together a whole bunch of research universities. And then, you know, basically by the late 1980s, you know, you have kind of the internet up and running um, in its modern form, but it's very contained to, you know, a, a relatively small set of users who are very technically sophisticated, you know, basically either at major research universities or military defense labs uh, or big companies of different kinds. Um, and then, you know, things kind of roll along for a while in that mode. And then, of course, you know, more, more famously, starting in the early 90s, you know, the internet became a consumer medium. And of course, that was, you know, that was the big breakthrough kind of the 93, 94. Um, and then, you know, the rest is, is more well known. And you talked about what was it? Eternal September. The Eternal September. So, so there was this phenomenon. So, the internet, in retrospect, so the internet between, call it, you know, the internet in its kind of modern form has existed. Call it from the early '80s to, you know, to, to now. But like from the early '80s to the early '90s, there was this about ten-year window, like I said, where it was this pretty esoteric thing 
um, it was very hard to actually get on the internet. Like you couldn't, you know, your, 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 your PC that you bought off the shelf did not have internet connectivity built in. Um, you know, it didn't have any of the software or hardware that you needed to be on the internet. So, so like just normal people at home were not on the internet in those days. Um, and so, uh, what would happen basically, um, is, so it, it was this sort of esoteric thing. And then it was a, it was a very, um, sort of implicitly selected group of users who were these extremely technically sophisticated users. They were almost all, you know, working professionals with advanced engineering degrees, you know, very intellectual, um, you know, um, you know, very engineering focused, you know, engineering culture. You know, so, so the internet, like in the 1980s, basically, for example, it, you know, there was like no spam, you know, there was no fraud, there was no trolling, <laughs> there was no, abuse, <laughs> yeah. there was no yeah. misinformation, there was no hate speech, there, you know, it was like, it, there was, there was a utopian element to it, just sort of as a consequence of the people who could get on it. Um, and then there was this phenomenon that these, this sort of internet old timers would know, you know, which was this, which is the September phenomenon, which is basically every September, a new generation of, you know, undergrads or grad students or newly arrived employees at these places that had internet access would show up, right? You know, most famously the, the undergrads and they would be on the internet and they would come kind of crashing into the internet in, into the culture in, in September. And then it was sort of the job of the old time internet people to kind of school the newbies on what they called netiquette, right? Which was, you know, sort of proper behavior, you know, how to basically how to not be an asshole. Um, and so it was sort of like every year it's like, oh, you know, God, okay, another September, you know, pain, you know, pain in the butt and spend people gross about it. Um, and then there was famously September, 1993, September, 1993. Um, that was the moment when America Online, AOL, which was a totally disconnected online service at the time, the consumer online services with, you know, whatever at the time, I don't know, at the time it was probably, I don't know, 5 million users or something, but that was a lot at the time. Um, AOL in one stroke put all whatever 5 million of their kind of normal people users um, onto the internet, like all at once. Um, and that became known as eternal September because that's basically when the concept of Connecticut blew up. That's basically when that original culture blew up. And that's basically when, the, you know, as we say now, the normies took over. Right. right. <laughs> and this is also when you went, mm-hmm. when you entered the story, right, Mark? I mean, yeah, that's you... right. It, it also coincided. It coincided. It, it all was like a fire burst, you know, sort of whatever, because it, it, it was this sudden, it was this, it was this, this huge kind of bolus of users who hit all at once. But yeah, the other thing that happened was that was when we were doing the web browser. And that's, that's around the time when we started Netscape. And that's the time basically when, you know, we, we were at Netscape, like able to package up all of the components you needed to get on the internet, put them in a box, put it on the store shelf that you could just buy and you could get on the internet. And then that's also when, you know, Microsoft and Apple and the PC companies started to build internet capabilities into the computers. And so, you yeah. know, that began the cascade that, that led to where we are today. And then, but yeah, so eternal, eternal September is yeah. basically the, oh my God, here they come, you know, in perpetuity. <laughs> yeah. The orcs are at the gate. And then going back to you and the, the browser. So it's Mosaic and then it's Netscape. And I suppose it's, um, it's an odd question because Tom and I have done, you know, 80 whatever episodes about history, but we've never done one with a kind of historical actor um, in the podcast. And I wonder, were you conscious when you were, you know, launching Netscape, for example, that you were in effect making history, that millions upon millions of people were going to be using this to communicate, to change the way they they talked to each other. They shopped. To, you know, to, it would change politics. It would change. I mean, did you have any sense of any of that, or were you too absorbed in the kind of the technical process? Well, so first of all, I, you know, I'm from the Midwest, and so if, even if I thought that, I could never admit that I thought that. Um, <laughs> so I would deny that all the way, all, all the way, all the way to my grave. Um, but um, you know, so the thing that the thing that's lost now in the history, which was a big deal then. Um, and, and, and this repeats itself over and over again. So I think about this a lot. Um, this was not obvious. Um, it was not obvious at all at that time that the internet was something that normal people would ever use, that there was ever any point to the normal person being on the internet or that the normal person would ever be able to figure out how to use the internet or that it would ever get to be easy to use or any of these things. Um, and in fact, it was quite the opposite. There was this wall of skepticism from, you know, what you might broadly call the establishment. Um, and, you know, by the establishment, I mean, it was a wall of skepticism from, um, you know, the big companies, from the big, you know, telecom companies, from the big tech companies. Um, you know, it was a wall of skepticism for sure from like, you know, that Hollywood and the content industry that they would ever put their content online. There was a wall of skepticism, um, you know, from the government that normal people would ever use this. Um, what, you know, I'll give you an example. One, one fun fact is, um, commercial activity on the internet, which is to say anything involving money, which is to say anything, including e-commerce, like the ability to buy something online, um, was technically illegal through 1993. Um, really? Goodness. It, was te- it was technically not permitted uh, by what were called the Internet Acceptable Use Policies, the AUP, which was sort of the, the sort of agreement that you had to have to kind of get on the, on the, on the net at that time. 
Um, and it was because, you know, the whole thing was up to that point was paid for by, you know, research, you know, federal research money. And so they just kind of took it for granted that obviously it would be improper to use the results of federal research for, for commercial purposes. So so th this was this was not obvious. Um, and in fact, there was this whole wave at the time. If you go back and read the press in the time, there was this whole wave that actually the future instead at the time was going to be what was called interactive television or what 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 would became known as you know, literally 500 channels. So, so the idea basically was you'd be able to watch 500 channels of TV and then interact they had what they called interactivity, which meant you could order a pizza with your remote control. And so it was there this very the, the sort of world, the sort of all of all the people in power at that time kind of had this view that there was just basically going to be, you know, that the role of the consumer, that this is actually right, the role of the consumer, the role of the individual is to be a couch potato, right? Uh, is to be a passive recipient, right, of content created by big companies, to sit on the couch, absorb, you know, and by the way, <laughs> there's some truth to this, right? You know, that, you know, here we are with Netflix. Um, you know, sit on the couch, absorb all this stuff, and then, you know, every once in a while click to, you know, either buy a pizza or maybe they'll drop off some toilet paper or something like that. Um, <laughs> This idea that, ind that individual users at scale were going to be part of a truly interactive network where they were going to be able to contribute just as much as they consumed, right? And then, you know, more, you know, to, you know, to, you know, taking us up to today, you know, it's the sort of massive impact of social media, the idea that, you know, you'd have all these people contributing their, <laughs> contributing their thoughts, whether you want to hear them or not, like that, that was just viewed as like, just like, cra that was just crazy. Like people just were like that, that's just complete crazy talk. And so, so what we knew was that the internet worked for the people who were already on it and that it worked much better for those people than I think uh, a lot of kind of normal people were understanding at that point. And then I just, here's, here's what I never understood. I never understood. I, I mentioned the internal September. There was another side to, 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 to the September phenomenon, which is, so I was, a, I was an undergrad at the university of Illinois. The entire campus was wired for broadband. It was on the internet. You could see the whole thing. Um, but the assumption was when you graduated, you would stop using it. Right. Like yeah. mm. you would just like stop using it. You, you would be on email until you graduated, then you're off email. Right. And, you, and, and I was like, well, that doesn't make any sense. And so I, I think that the, the honest answer is you could squint and you could kind of say, OK, you know, like forget for a moment whether or not this will take among the broader population. But like if it does, like what would that mean and how big could this get? And you could squint and you could see that because you could see those behaviors. But it was still a big conceptual leap that this would be mainstream. Mark, I mean, as, as someone who wasn't an engineer, who, who had no technical sophistication or ability whatsoever. I, I, for what it's worth, I remember in 1989, uh, the autumn, I, I was at Oxford and there was a, a friend from California and he had one of those small um, uh, Macs, you know, um, which I found revelatory. But the other thing that he showed me that I also remember being revelatory was um, a copy of William Gibson's Neuromancer, which had come out yep. in 1984 and described something called cyberspace and described it, you know, this consensual hallucination that you, you, you went online and you experienced it. And I remember through the 90s, never buying into this idea that the internet was something like, you know, CB radio or something, because I had this image of, of, the, of it being the future that had actually been written in 1984 of all, dec of all years. And I wonder, do, am I unusual in that? Or do you think the fact that it, it, the internet came with this sense, you know, trailing clouds of science fiction with it, at this sense that it was making the future was always there, even before the internet had actually kind of gone mainstream. Yeah, that's right. I, I think that's right. I think, you know, yeah, there was for sure a threat of science fiction. By the way, there was also a threat of kind of what you might call pop science, where people were talking about these things like the, you know, there, 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 there had been this wave of enthusiasm in the 80s around what were, what were called uh, uh, BBSs, which were kind of these kind of you know, these dial-up services that individual users were offering other other services uh, to other users. Um, yeah, there was, there was, you know, various, yeah, there were various kinds of, 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 of movies and TV shows through that era. Um, you know, there was a huge boom, you know, huge interest in, um, you know, in the early 80s, there were, you know, <laughs> you know in, at least in America, you know, there were these TV shows like Knight Rider and, and Airwolf and so forth with, you know, sort of really kind of glamorized, you know, this sort of really advanced computer technology. Um, and so, yeah, there, you know, there was a lot of that, like it, it was present in the culture. Um, by the way, the, the, the most amazing thing about Neuromancer, which I highly recommend people read if they haven't, um, cause it is, it was very influential and it was also influential on me, but, um, yeah, William Gibson, the author famously, uh, had not used a computer, uh, refused to use a computer, um, and, uh, wrote that, <laughs> he wrote that novel on a yeah. typewriter. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Maybe that means so. you can see more clearly if you're not, you know, if you're viewing it as a pure outsider, which he was. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Right. So, so, so the internet is up and running and then, and then you, you start to get social media. So how, how big a change is that? Well, that's the network, isn't it? I mean, you mentioned network already, um, the word a few times. And I think, I mean, I don't know if you agree, Mark, but is it a new, completely new kind of network, social media? 
Yeah, so the the basic mechanics behind social media are very old. Um, they actually, the, the total prehistory here that goes actually back to the 1950s, there was a computer system actually at the University of Illinois in the 1950s called Plato, uh, P-L-A-T-O. You guys will appreciate the name. Um, and um, it, uh, was actually, it was actually an interactive multi-user computer system in the 1950s that they built basically entirely by hand. You know, it's very crude by obviously our standards, but it had, you know, the, the minute they had it up and running, they had different, you know, kind of nodes that were together. And then the minute they did that, they had messaging happening between the nodes. And then they had, you know, multiplayer games and they had, you could put, you know, status messages and kind of say, you know, I'm, you know, I'm out of the office or I'm, you know, available to chat or I'm hungry or you know, whatever. Um, and so, that, you know, they had the, the rudiments right up front, um, you know, the 1960s, multi-user computer computing kind of went a little bit more broad. Again, the first thing you did when you network computers together even in a small environment, even like in an office environment, was you started to have messaging and these kinds of, you know, kind of rudimentary social features. Um, and then, you know, like I said, you had in the, in the 80s, you had this boom, even before kind of the internet would mainstream, you had this boom in what were called these bulletin board systems or BBSs where people would log in and, you know, have these, you know, they would have literally bulletin boards, they'd have forums, you know, and there would be everything from classified ads to, you know, <laughs> you know dating applications to, you know, to, to, to uh, you know, to, to the ability to chat with other users. And then, you know, AOL, CompuServe, Prodigy, where these kind of commercialized BBSs, they had a lot of these capabilities. Um, and so, like, there, there was, you know, a lot of these, like, the general pattern that I've seen is, like, for any of these things that, like, break through to, to the mass market in tech, it's like, there's, there's always, like, a 40 or 50 year kind of back history as sort of the ideas are being incubated. Um, social media, as we know it today, you know, kind of broke out. Um, it actually started in the late 90s. Um, you know, there was Friendster in around 2000. There was MySpace in around 2002. And then, you know, Facebook kind of hit the scene in 2004, 2005. Um, you know, there were a couple things that really kind of catalyzed the sort of massive social networking boom starting in the mid-2000s, you know, really with like Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, I would say the two, two big things is one is just that that, that that happened to be when the, the consumer internet actually kind of became mainstream. Um, which is actually an interesting historical thing because the, you know, the, the 90s were the quote unquote dot com boom, but mo even most Americans were not on the internet in the 1990s, um, right? It, it, it was still a minority thing to even do. Um, and it wasn't really until the mid 2000s that you started to have kind of the tip where a majority of the population actually got on the internet. And that was also around the same time that broadband, um, you know, actually became a thing. And so there, there was just this kind of moment there um, where you, you kind of hit critical mass. Uh, on the users. Um, and then the other thing was, you know, the, the, the sort of other just gigantic, I think, innovation in retrospect, uh, in particular, uh, around Facebook, which had a huge impact um, uh, on things um, was Mark Zuckerberg was the first internet entrepreneur who basically, you know, stood up with a straight face and said, people are going to use their real names on the internet. Right. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> Right, which is really interesting because, like, basically before that, and this is again kind of maybe lost lost history now, but like before that, the assumption was you could use the internet all day long, but the one thing you would never do is use your real name, right? Um, you would always use a number or a, or whether it's called a screen name or you know whatever a login ID or something or a you know a pseudonym of some kind, and you would but basically why? do that. Why? Well, because because everybody knew, right? Everybody's like the internet's not the real world; like it's this other different thing. You know, it's this kind of weird thing. It's kind of nerdy and weird. Um, <laughs> by the way, you know, Dungeons and Dragons, wild... kind of. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. And then, and then, by the way, it's the Wild West. If you know, a, a, and this was a term at the time. And you know, a lot of the press coverage in the nineteen nineties were the internet is the Wild West. And you know, and at that point, it was like you know, there are criminals in the Wild West. They're bad guys. And, you know, there's spam and there's you know, fraud and. There was this whole like one of the big things we had to get early early in the in the nineties get people comfortable with was like basically the idea of ever basically paying for anything online, um, and 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 you know credit cards were kind of the way people paid for things online, um, and um, you know the idea of putting your credit card number on the internet was like a very scary thing for a long time, and so it was another one of these things where like you know you might get stolen, you, you know, identity there was a whole rush of panic around identity theft or identity might get stolen and ruin your life if people found out who you were. So so yeah, it was it was like everybody put a mask on. Um, and then, you know, it's one of these generational things where, you know, Mark Zuckerberg is, you know, was what uh, he's probably what 15, he's probably 15 years younger than I am or something. So, um, you know, and he, so he, he kind of, you know, kind of came of age in the nineties as all this stuff was happening. And to him, it was just like, oh, it was just a different mentality. It's like, oh, obviously this is going to be part of everyday life. You know, obviously this is going to be something that you do all the time. Um, but just obviously you should represent yourself. Like it should be you, like, why wouldn't it be? Um, and then that, you know, that, I think that was really the tipping point because at, at that point, then all of a sudden it was like, it was like the internet changed from like this land of weird, you know, all these, yeah, all these, you know, this, this sort of, I don't know, sort of weird, I don't know, low end video game or something where you had all these kind of fake people running around. All of a sudden it's like, oh my God, they're all my friends, right? There they are, right? And then that was, that was the big breakthrough. So Tom, I've never gone on Facebook. Are you on Facebook? 
I'm not on Facebook. No, I'm, I, I uh, no, I. But for the same reason, I'm not on crack. <laughs> <laughs> but that's your reason for not playing Assassin's Creed. Exactly. I, I, I have a very addictive personality, and I, I'm, I'm nervous for all these things. But also, in the in the case of Facebook, it is kind of, um, I suppose, a kind of nervousness about um, having uh, all my most intimate details singing off to California to be processed. Yeah, it's, but, it's, but, but we're, this we're coming t- from a man who live tweets his walks. I know, um, which, <laughs> I know, but that, but that's 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 the terrible thing. That's why I know that I should never go on Facebook, um, and why I always vowed that I would never do a podcast. So right. yeah. there you go. So <laughs> I, th- <laughs> that's I, th- I think that's probably the perfect note on which to bring this episode to an end <laughs> yes. um, and to set up um, the second episode with Mark Andreessen, where we will talk about social media. We'll talk about um, so software eating the world and the kind of broader sense in which, uh, you know, how, how do we place this in the broadest context of history? How does this relate yeah. to printing and so on so, and of course in um in in you know to honor your commitment to your disregard for social media we should be advertising it on twitter as we always do and i might even sign up to facebook to do it very good we'll see you next time for part two bye bye. this week Buckingham Palace has announced that it is reconsidering plans for Camilla, Queen Consort, to wear the world-famous Kohinoor diamond in her crown. Seized by the East India Company and presented to Queen Victoria, the diamond became part of the crown jewels and is now one of the most controversial pieces of colonial loot. I'm William Durimple, and alongside Anita Anand, I host Empire, a podcast from the creators of The Rest is History. We just released a mini series covering the entire thousand year history of the Koinor, the empires who built it, the bloodshed and betrayal committed for it, and the curse that still haunts it. To hear the incredible story of the world's most infamous diamond, and to make your own mind about who should own it, search Empire wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening to The Rest is History. For bonus episodes, early access, ad-free listening, and access to our chat community, please sign up at restishistorypod.com. That's restishistorypod.com. Listener.